Hi and welcome to part two of Amash and we're talking with Jeff Scott from uh, the Reading area. Jeff had just been finishing telling us in part one about uh, an incident where they were on some land, they'd met a, um, a runner who looked like a military surveillance guy and then came back to their car to find it blocked in by a man who for all intents and purposes looked like an SAS guy and who was questioning them about whether the car was stolen or not, which belonged to Jeff. So we're now going to pick up the rest of the story with Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for coming back and finishing the story with us. There, uh, as I said, my car was blocked in. Uh, there was some searching questions about how we got ne how near we got to a certain compound up the hill, uh, and the bloke paused and just didn't say anything. Uh, I said, it's all right, if I get my car out then. And he still didn't say anything. He just stood there. All As if stalling for time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All of a sudden, it's helicopters, about 70 to 80 foot off the ground. I mean, I work on buildings, so yeah. I know how high a building is. Yeah. And I know what it looks like, an 80 foot building or a 100 yeah. foot building. And was this one, one helicopter? It was a black... Uh, like the Bell Jet Ranger that used to get in James Bond films. Yeah. It was one of those. It was about 70 to 80 foot off the floor. It, it comes straight over our head. It spun around about 80 metres from us. Yeah. And then come back for a, for a pass straight over us as we all stood there next to my car. Uh, yeah, we all looked up at it, thought, my God, what's going to happen next? Yeah. Uh, as soon as it had gone over for the pass... The man got in his car, like, moved it out of the way, and we were allowed to go. But yeah, this helicopter, it was jet black, uh, had loads of things bolted to the skids, right. to the underside, loads of like big, obviously, cameras and Right, so they were coming around to take pictures. All, yeah, we yeah. had our pictures taken right, 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 like, right. properly, yeah. and uh, there we were allowed to go. Yeah, on, so, on, you, so you went off, and uh, I believe you might have been followed, were you, then? Yeah, on the, on the way out of there, we've gone down the road about half a mile, we should have really gone straight on down this road. We were look, looking on the map at other Roman bits and pieces in the area. I said, hold on, let's, let's go down here. Like, I think my mate was reading the map, I was driving. He said, I was a Roman blah blah. So we've, we've stopped, gone down a side road that we wouldn't have normally have gone down. We mm. would have gone straight on. Uh, we've gone into this side country lane and there, there was a bloke sat on a motorbike He's looked totally startled that the car was coming, and he's quickly threw his crash helmet on really quickly, as if to hide his face. Mm. And as we've gone past, I said, "Look, he's doing the dodgy. He's doing the dodgy. He's, he's either hiding ten key of skag in the bush, I think, was my, <laughs> or he's there to follow us." And we've all laughed about it. Got gone past him. I've gone down the road, turned left, gone down another lane, stopped. All of a sudden, he's come past us. Like he's come round the bend, expecting us to still be going, but we've stopped yeah, by the road. See a Roman ruins. Yeah. He's had to come past us, and like, and I've seen this bloke. He was on a large motorcycle, like uh, five hundred, seven fifty, or something like that. I see him again a couple of months later. Oh, really? Uh, near to the other place I told you about, mm. Christmas Common, and he was then sat on a small one two five with an L plate on it. And I remember he was a, had an open face crash helmet this time. He was just parked by the side of the road while we was mooching about in this area. I said, that's that bloke from right. the other week. And Jay, yeah, he had like a Shakespearean kind of beard. Yeah. It's it about 50 odd. Yeah, I thought it quite strange that he was on a bike with a, a small 125 with an L plate on when mm. the other week he'd been on the big yeah. British 750 or whatever yeah. it was. Yeah, but, yeah, well, yeah. that's not right. So clearly the surveillance going yeah, on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think after that, perhaps, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, the next major sort of incident happened when you were. Um, was, was did you go to Manchester first, or was there an incident after uh, before then? Uh, um, I can't remember. Can't remember anything else that stands out. But okay. I went to work in Manchester to repair the so-called IRA bomb damage, which was. It's probably just an inside job, like to regenerate yeah. the town centre. It's probably security services planted the device or in a truck or whatever it was. 
Uh, yeah, we it's went. A serious allegation. Do you have any evidence for that, or is it just rumour? Uh, I watched a video the other day, and I thought it it, it was yeah, it was alleging that sort of uh, scenario that that was an inside job, and I thought, well, to be quite honest, I've always thought that. I've always thought it. Uh, so, so it's just something replace, I felt in my what heart. What did they replace the old buildings with? Uh, the building I worked on was, uh, I worked on the roof of the Marks and Spencers six-storey building. It was like their flagship Marks and Spencers right. store. Mm. Uh, I think it was six, six storeys. We were working on the roof, doing all the cladding and glazing yeah. to various mm. bits of modules on the roof. It's a massive place. Mm. Uh, yeah, when I used to work there, there, there used to be a clock tower just across from our six-storey position where I was doing most of my work, there was a clock tower and a couple of times a week like there'd be this box in a plastic bag like, and it would move and it would be in different positions and hmm. I always used to say to my mate, what's in the box up there? It was like someone had put a camera in to right. survey our position sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I was aware of surveillance all the time. It was just normal, as I said. Yeah. It was, you, know, you used to get it in three-month blocks. Oh, did you? If you'd been really bad, they'd be outside your house for six months. And what do you mean by being bad? Uh, well, uh, that's to to come like a couple of years down the line. Right. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. So it was about 1999, I think, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was the summer of 99. Yeah. Uh, about August times. Uh, this particular week, uh, the key to my room had gone missing for. 24 hours about 24 can I, can hours. I just can I just say just to just to backfill that that you because you'd been working away you were staying at a at yeah, a coach house staying in a coach house yeah. which was above a pub yes Wait, right. which neck of the woods was it it was it, it was in Cheatham Hill in che Manchester, Cheatham Hill which Manchester. is a really yeah. rough deprived area yeah uh, but that's where you were lodging whilst you were doing this this job yeah and so sorry continue yeah uh, uh, your keys had gone this, missing the key to my room went missing uh, for about 24 hours. The proprietor of the place, I can't remember her name, uh, she had inherited the place from her father. She said, keys never go missing. Mm. They never had their keys go missing from the rack, which is right. by the, the kitchens. Mm. Uh, you didn't get many people in this place because of the area it was right. in, Cheatham Hill. It, mm. it wasn't a bustling mm. uh, hotel or anything. It was far from it. Uh, yeah, the key went missing. My bags were searched. Uh, I noticed the, the zips had been moved on my bags, nothing taken out of it. I used right. to leave my bag in the room, uh, all that had a mobile phone in it. Right. I never used to have my mobile phone on me in those days. Uh, yeah, my bag was obviously searched, the uh, key had gone missing to the room. Uh, one particular night I'd come home, um, came upstairs, we used to get free evening meals. So I've come into like the large room, which was like a banqueting room. Mm. Uh, all set with tables, very nice, uh, to get my evening meal. Uh, on this particular occasion, usually it was completely empty. Uh, we were the only ones in there. On this particular occasion, I've come into the, the room. There was two men and a woman. A woman had long blonde hair. Men were quite cleanly dressed. Uh, what I noticed was quite strange. They would not look at me. I mean, most people... If someone comes into a big empty room where they are, they'd, they'd at least glance. glance yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they did normal. not. They wouldn't even glance or look at me. I found I found that very strange. Uh, sat down at my meal, retired to my room. Uh, came to about eleven o'clock. Got bored of watching what was ever on Sky Channel. At that stage, I was in a room on my own. Uh, the bosses, obviously, in another room. Uh, I think maybe that week I was on my own. I didn't have any mates with me, I don't think. I can't remember. But I was in a room on my own. Uh, I was getting ready to turn in. There was a microwave event, is the only way I can describe it. There was this buzzing sound that lasted for about two and a half seconds. Like a burst of energy. Yeah. Really. yeah. Uh, microwave energy. Two bands come across the bottom of the television screen. Mm. And they had chevrons. Chevron shaped, yeah. Chevrons inside oh, the right. bands. Mm. And they're going across. And whatever that 
energy event was it it frightened me i didn't know why it frightened me but that oh, was right. extremely uh Made quite frightening mm. yeah it was like mm. a, a deep buzzing sound and it it was quite unnerving mm. i thought that's not a police radio or a fire fire yeah. brigade radio mm. interference and i thought nothing of it uh turned the light out turned in telly off turned in for the night the next thing i'm consciously remember <coughs> is everything being black all I can remember is the foot of my bed seeing the head of a woman with long blonde hair stood at the foot of my bed and then my vision just blacked out it like came in mm. and all, mm. all I had originally like was inwards, the like, like a... framed head of a blonde woman yeah Sort of foot through of a slight bed. triangular and it was like quite mm. fuzzy but you could quite clearly see the, the long blonde hair mm. my vision was she just, standing yeah i think yeah, so to be yeah. standing. Mm. my vision just blacked out gone and next thing i, I know consciously of i'm awake in my bed my oh, heart's like almost beating through my chest and i'm extremely traumatized by whatever's taken place uh, you know, I just lay in my bed and waited for my heart to stop beating. Uh, I'm not sure if I noticed straight away the pain, uh, like a bruise, bruising pain in the prostate area, but that was soon to become apparent. Uh, I was so traumatised by whatever had happened that I lay there and looked at the clock. It was about half past twelve, so it was probably half an hour after I'd turned into bed. Right. I looked at that clock from half past twelve until it was time to get up at seven in the morning. I thought, good, it's time to go to work. And I got up and just went through my day. Did you examine yourself at that point? Uh, I was aware of like, having a bruise down below. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't go into a full medical examination, but I was aware no, but, of mm. having a very, very sore mm. bruise yeah. localised in a small area. Uh, yeah, what... I think happened after putting it all together like the the following months of surveillance uh, going here and there uh, hearing high pitch fre high pitch radio frequency sounds right it'd go up it'd go down it'd tune into the middle and as if trying to latch on. on yeah lock it'd on. lock on lock on to you and uh, it was like cat and mouse my whole life was like cat and mouse I'd right. tried to get away and they'd track me um, Can I basically just go I was mm. an experiment in right. tracking chips right. in human being beings in real time. Hang on to that thought for a second. just want to go back to, to, to the bruising and the injury because did you say you had a, a, a triangular mark yeah, in that I've, neck of the woods I've as well? Yeah, since or? Look, looked right. and there was okay. like a large uh, triangular mark yeah. uh, in keeping with a large calibre hypodermic right. needle being stabbed into. Oof. So, yeah. yeah, that wasn't very nice and... And how long did it take to recover, for the body to recover from that uh, assault? Well, it never really has. I've still got the chip inside me as far as I know. Right. So the bruising, just like yeah, it's just ordinary. a normal deep bruise yeah. would probably take a week or so mm. to mm. to heal. But yeah, I was used as an experiment and hounded from pillar to post. Uh, I couldn't get away. Do you know uh, why why that may be? Why you were <coughs> targeted? Well, I believed it was because I'd seen too many of these secret facilities. Right, um, okay. So they're keeping an eye on I you. I think once they latch on to you as a, an individual that seems like a good target, they'll leech on to you and just you know, do what they've got to do. Right. And you well, become any, their subject. Were any of your friends targeted? <coughs> uh they were probably targeted for surveillance only because they were friends of mine. Right, uh, okay. I've had no one else yeah. come do you, out with anything. Do you associate any of this? I think they've had problems like that. Yeah, do you associate any of this with the ET or the paranormal element uh, at the moment? Now, uh, thinking back on it, I kind of think that maybe. Uh, if you, you become a person of interest to other intelligences, 
our intelligence services will then latch on to you and right. they want to know what's going on. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, I believe there's probably a, a bit of that involved. Yeah. yeah. I think they probably know who you are and what you've experienced. And mm. Yeah, they, they've heard a lot of bugged conversations and they've heard me talk about uh, ET experiences, which I've had yeah. over the phone and probably around electronics, which yeah. could have potentially been bugged. So. And, and, and they've heard a lot of my conversations yeah. and I haven't really hidden nothing. And yeah. Are you aware of any sensation or anything from the area that was targeted? Or does it, it's just, you're just aware because you knew of the incident that something's there? Yeah. But there's no was, other sensation? There's no other sensations. No, it goes no, with it. Yeah. The fact that in my hometown I can get away from someone that wants to chase me if I want to because it's my hometown mm. I would get away but they would always track me down They'd always, I would get on a push bike and and no one could catch me on a push bike it's my hometown that's where mm. I've lived and yeah they, they always catch up with you and I thought well the only way is like having a chip inside you right? And because of the frequent radio frequency and every time I go out on a jaunt down to Wales or something at the time in particular I went with one of my ex-girlfriends and yeah, I was followed up down mountains and really mm. yeah and mm. of the amount of times I've heard the thing lock on go right. up down and lock right in the middle and lock on yeah it's, so you can feel it lock on and yeah. and so you're mm. aware that you're being tracked let's say D do, do you feel that it interferes with your thought processes as well or, uh, or, or there's any I don't know any difference so right I couldn't okay. answer that Right. I remember I've got a truck, a six ton Mercedes truck, and mm -hmm. I kitted it out as I'd like my house to be in. I aluminium foil taped the inside of it so that I could get a good night's sleep from radio frequency. Right. Uh, that, that was before any of this happened, I think. Well, I slept in that, I used to sleep in that truck outside my mate's house in uh, part of South Reading. I remember one time I've sl slept in the truck. And I could hear, it was about two o'clock in the morning, there was like an obviously military light aircraft. It kept making passes over the truck at two o'clock in the morning over a civilian mm. populated area. They don't usually do that. And I think, I, I thought at the time, I thought they can't get a proper lock onto me because I'm inside right. an aluminium mm. covered vehicle, mm. which... Is obviously gonna. So they knew you were in the vicinity, just couldn't yeah, get the lock on. Yeah. Right. This was two in the morning. It did about twenty, twenty-five, thirty passes over me. It'd mm. Go off like a few kilometres yeah. and, and come back round exactly yeah. over my truck, sort of thing, quite high. Yeah. I think it's a twin-engine light aircraft, and. Yeah, well, that's it, unusual, anyway, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Civilian yeah. aircraft are not allowed to fly yeah. over populated areas at two in the morning. Yeah, so twenty-five times it just doesn't happen. No, that so let's, let's, let's go. Like a, let's go on now. I think we're um, getting chronologically to to that point where you had some some um, altercation at a, at a I don't know. Is a club? I don't know if it's a boxing club again or it was, where, uh, where where exactly it was, but. It was a, a in, squat party in a squatted building right, in, okay. in London, yes. uh, which Thanks. I used to love going to them for the music. I love drum bass. Uh, yeah, the height of... Th that's it. Uh, a week after... It was about five days after September the 11th and the Americans' right. uh, buildings got turned to dust. Uh, the girl, my girlfriend at, at the time, R Rachel... Uh, she used to live in South Ryslip, West London. She oh, was a photography yeah. student, mm -hmm. and she was down in Reading, staying with me for the weekend. And we went out into the countryside, and the nicest bits of countryside I know are right in the vicinity of all these uh, facilities or alleged facilities. There's one particular place where there's a nice yew forest mm -hmm. up this dead end road, but on the way down this dead end road, there's there's like a. It looks. It's meant to look like a reservoir in the middle of a field. It's huge. It's just this big field. If you can imagine a field that's like a, a low sloping, the whole field right. is sort of like like a, with a, a lump on the top that's about 40 foot square with little tiny little railings around it. Hmm. And now they've got a couple of like 
little antennas there sort of thing it's meant to be like for all intensive purposes look like a reservoir a water reservoir oh i see yeah my yeah. friend grew up in that area from the, in the 70s and all the locals knew that was like a, an underground command bunker right in this field it's all got right. food down there and all sorts okay it was like an emergency command bunker yeah and everyone's supposed to have forgotten about this sort of yeah. thing but my mate told me he said oh yeah that place he said i grew up around there so mm. going motorcycling in the area that's that's a an underground food storage place obviously a command yeah. bunker that's in the vicinity of the chiltern hills and right where these other yeah. suspect yeah. buildings are yeah. uh, i've gone down this road on an afternoon go i'm driving her car my girlfriend's got a camera flash on it big uh proper camera with lens on it she took a flash photograph of this uh, bunker on the way back down this road because it was raining and we went down the road for oh no I ain't going to go in the woods it's raining so we come back along so we've, basically we've gone down this road then come back past this facility and she took a big flash photograph of it it was about the times just after September the 11th so at the weekend following this a week later I've gone into London and gone to a party in this building it was North London uh, several floors it was like a an abandoned warehouse like which still had a lot of files in there and stuff like but it was empty and the boys from London had taken it over put sound systems in there and had this party uh, I was in there I was looking after a, a mate of mine, she'd done some ketamine or something like that. She was flat out on the floor, upstairs, on a floor where there was no music. I thought, well, I'd better keep watching her, make sure she don't get robbed. So I was just pacing about and just making sure she, no one took advantage of her. And uh, I was near the, the top of a staircase. The next thing I knew, I remember seeing like a small red light. It was probably a targeting laser. And then bang, like this flash that like, took out my eyes and I sort of struggled to see and I've looked and I see this Middle Eastern man put something into a brown paper shopping bag and proceed to run away down the stairs away from me oh, right. and I've like gone down on the floor holding my eyes and it really really packed a punch and by that time uh whoever had come in under the guise of noise abatement and shut the building down, like it turned off, told mm. the sound systems they got shut down, at which stage like, there was military personnel in twos and threes just walking about the building. Right? Would you say that would um, be normal to see uh, military people that are you know, telling a squad uh, party to stop? Usually MI5 come in and people usually sniff them out and say, as a spy over there, look at him. And Why would you think MI5 would be in? Everyone knows that that's... It's domestic terrorism, isn't it? If you plug in a speaker and entertain your mates outside or in an empty building, you're a domestic terrorist. That is a category that they've classified you oh, as, like, if right. you do that sort of behaviour. Uh, yeah, all these personnel were walking about this building. All the sound had been shut down. Uh, I've... On the ground floor of inside this building, I've looked, I see this bloke in an army green coat, not a DPM, but mm. just a plain green coat, sort of that you get from mm. army surplus or something, quite a tall chap. Under his arm, he had this, he had like a camera strap, and it had like, you know, those million candle watt power torches right, that you yes. get yeah, with yeah. a handle mm. and the big yeah, yeah. reflector. It looked like one of those. It was dark grey or black uh, I've looked at it I'm still seeing like the burning of the reflector into my eyes that's burned into my retinas I've looked at this thing I thought that is what done my eyes I've walked over to him he stood in the doorway I said let's have a look at your torch mate and he's, he's proceeded to point it in my face he said I think you just got the idea didn't you I think you got the idea earlier didn't you oh, I, said, right. I said all right mate uh, I've sort of backed off, right? And this thing, I've already had it mm. wiping out my vision. Mm. Right? Uh, I've had it again pointed in my face. Uh, so I've backed off. 
Uh, about 10-15 minutes later, I've seen the same bloke at a different position in the ground floor of this building. He was on his own. Uh, there was people milling about everywhere. I was angry from having my eyes burnt out. I've, I've gone up to him. Uh, I've gone straight up to him. I said again, I said, let's have a look at your torch, mate. And of, of this time, I've just grabbed it from under his arm, yeah. grabbed hold of the handle and started to look at it while the strap's still around his shoulder. He's like looking about for his support. Mm. Uh, he said, oh, you can get them anywhere for £15. I've looked at it and oh, thought, £15? This looks like several thousand pounds worth of mm. like assault yeah. uh, strobe gun. And whilst I'm looking at it and it's the straps around his shoulder, I've pressed the trigger and I just see the strobe effect yeah. off of his eyeballs and mm. uh, I was let go of it and he said you didn't have to do that and I said well you've done it to me so I've done it to you and I've walked away uh, I've left the party uh, I've drove down the M4 I was aware of like a Land Rover weaving in and out of traffic to follow me mm. down the M4 and that was the start of six month surveillance uh, they, they, uh, they really didn't like that uh, the fact that I'd taken one of their weapons mm. out of their hands and mm. used it on them innocently. Like, man told me it was a £15 torch. Mm. But, and do you think uh, that this surveillance perhaps had anything to do with your girlfriend taking a, a picture of the installation? It was installation? directly a result you of think it's directly a taking result? a picture of that right. facility. Okay. It was a warning not to yeah. take pictures of things that you shouldn't right. it's and like you've seen too much now we're going to burn your eyes out mm. and I might add it took a year for the burns on my eyes to heal for the next fortnight after it happened it was like having a toothache in each eyeball mm. it was horrific I spent a couple of years thinking I was going to go blind right. uh, I went to an optician and he said well you've just had like a massive amount of light put in your eyes when you're older, you might get cataracts a little bit earlier than what you would have mm. if you're going to get it anyway. Mm, oh, lovely. So, yeah, but a year for the burns to heal. Yeah. Well, it's not a nice weapon. I've, no. I've heard it. it wasn't something like that used on Henry Paul like, by someone un in the underpass. Like, uh, I heard reference to a strobe flash gun that was used. That's true, you know, actually, I've, I've yeah, that's well, right. I've just, there, I've just there heard. Is, there is talk of the... Um, um, cruise control was remotely operated and set to full speed mm. and uh, that's one way of steering it mm. but uh. where the car hit is an energy line that goes underneath the Eiffel Tower and into the assembled buildings there and was this Picture. around also the time that you and then Rachel in South Ryslip had an event yeah of yeah, another well, kind it was around Christmas so it was like probably Christmas 99 uh, Went out for a couple of drinks together, staying at her house, uh, gone to bed. It was her father's house, like, gone to bed, crashed out, uh, woke up exactly the same time as each other, both sat up in bed exactly the same time, within, within even 20 seconds of waking up, Rachel said, my arm, and I looked straight at... Uh, the upper left arm there was like three needle marks in a triangle triangular mm, formation yeah, like right. about six mil across mm. three needle marks and you could see they were blatantly needle marks yeah uh when i've looked at her arm I was, oh, I've got, she's, i think she said you got nosebleed and like, I had blood streamed down my face and i had to get up and go and mm. get some tissue so yeah within a minute of waking up like she's noticed like three holes in her arm and yeah. all of a sudden I've had a, instantly had a nosebleed yeah which that was at the height of the surveillance so right I can't help thinking there's some sort of if not collusion between intelligence services and ETs mm. or I don't know what all the intelligence services have got access to a technology where they yeah. can come into your yeah 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 interdimensional technology they can come in and just do whatever they've got to do to you and yeah. just leave why do you think that what brought that to your attention 
the uh, conclusions? Well, recently... You've gone from being flash, from a from flash gun and things, and taking pictures of the base, but suddenly you're talking about they're directly involved with ETs? Well, the fact that she had free, blatantly free needle marks on her and I had, suddenly had a nosebleed means that something's gone on. Now, her f we were in her father's house. No one's broke in. And but why connect that with ETs? Why not just surveillance people coming in when you're asleep? Uh, What's the thing that makes you think that as ET? It's, it's just that most people that have problems in the area of their nose usually have had problems with extraterrestrials, like namely greys, putting implants up their nostrils. Military abductions, I've heard of that phenomenon. Yeah, uh, uh, I believe that is... Well, Just how do you make the jump to ETs? It's, I've heard so many people, uh, people that have had abduction experiences, uh, talk of having nose implants. And that just like rings to me that you know, someone's... I, I can't see that they would pick the lock on your house and come up the stairs and like do, do that sort of thing to you, put things up your nose. So I think either you've been taken out of the house in a spacecraft or they've used technology to get into the house without going through the door or any of the normal channels. I think when, when they use that sort of technology... I think it's got to be either ETs or it's in collusion uh, intelligence services in cahoots with ETs. Uh, it's, it's, I really don't know. I don't have any answers. It's quite interesting it, it's too because you've, you've had an experience sort of going back to the ET thing and I know that the, the nose people come back to that a, a, again in a minute. But um, you were telling me that... Um, you had been seeing a, f a friend of yours. You'd had some socialising. I'm thinking of, of Alan, and um, also the the lady whom you, I think you went on holiday Adele, with, and, yeah. and and I think those two, do, do, you know, to sort of tie up some ET element, that might be interesting if you talk about those two two things now. Yeah, uh, Adele was uh, a girl I was seeing for about a year and a half. Uh, 2010, I took her to Cornwall. We I know we've jumped a bit in time, but I think it's important. Yeah, the, the to... first night of our holiday in Cornwall, I said, oh, let's, let's go across the road into the potato field, look at the sunset. Uh, so I've got a couple of bottles of Rattler cider, a couple of cheap champagne glasses, just for a laugh. And uh, yeah, we proceeded to look at the sunset. It's about nine o'clock in the summer's evening. Uh, she's... All I can describe it, she's gone a bit funny. She started speaking in like a childish, sort of impish way. Uh, Did her physical voice change or just the manner in which she delivered it? The manner in which she delivered it. Right. It sounded childish and impish mm. and she had like a grin on her face. And She used to have blue eyes and when I spoke to her the other week I described her eyes as being beady. And I thought yes, about it did. afterwards. Yeah. Before. My God, were her eyes actually a different colour when she was... Mm. Yeah, point being she went a bit funny she started stroking one side of my face and uh this is apropos of nothing i mean no nothing precipitated this you were just no, having no. a drink and enjoying the scene and it then was, all uh, of a sudden her voice <laughs> changes it's like almost like a possession in a way yeah i yeah. mean that's my description of it not yours i know but that's interesting so she's stroking your face and then she said uh what's it she said she said uh I've watched you while you're sleeping. Uh, she said something about me being good. She said yes, that you were good or something. I'm very good, and but she'd seen the that's light. it. She said she mm. she said you don't know who you are, do you? She started stroking my face. Mm. She said you're very good, very good. She reiterated it. I was a bit taken aback by that. Uh, she said, I've watched you while you were sleeping. Uh, I've seen you change. I was thinking, you know, come on, tell me more. <laughs> and uh, she made reference to a time when I was at my friend's wedding. He had a marquee in the middle of nowhere on a bit of land, uh, owned by someone the land was. Had a bishop there, got married to his girlfriend. We all 
slept in tents. Well, we didn't sleep. I was up to about five in the morning, <laughs> uh, dancing in the tent. But uh, yeah, about six, half six in the morning, I've come back to the tent, just lay on the floor. And uh, Adele had been in the tent. Like she didn't have a liking for mm. the same music as me. So I've come and crashed out in the tent, just flaked out. Uh, well, anyway, when we're in Cornwall, she said, you know, you don't know who you are, do you? Uh, you're very good. So I watched you while you were sleeping. I've seen the veins on your face uh, come across your cheeks. So I've seen the light come out of your eyelids and out of your lips. As if you were changing form, like tra transforming yeah. in a way. Yeah. Um, did, did you say what to? I, what I, I should say, like, you know, shape-shifting... Uh, Dr. B Bill Deagle, he said the laws of thermodynamics don't actually allow for a physical form to change, which I don't know. I, I don't know. I've seen transfiguration mediums, so I don't know. I've seen them but change. I believe it is possible <laughs> for someone to perceive another dimensional yeah. reality of yourself. Mm. Uh, so I believe that's what that was. But what she so was she, implying yeah. that I had light coming out of my lips, white light and out of my eyelids, mm. and I had like, marks. What, all, what, do you, what do you think those... Like, she, the way she was describing it, she described so I had, like ridges like a reptilian or something. Okay. okay. And, uh, so that was a bit of a shock. I've taken that on board and put it to one side, and after that she, she was completely... That, that, that's it, before that incident finished, turned round and pointed to the sun she said the new sun will be over there and she pointed uh, to the right of it and down oh i've just gone chills i don't know what that means and mm. she said we'll still have the old sun but the new one will be there and i thought okay uh interesting mm. and after that it's, it's sort of the situation's dissipated. We've drunk our ciders and gone back to the campsite. And has she come back to normal? She perfectly returned? normal. Like, Voice perfectly normal. normal and yeah, yeah. And she perfectly did... normal. Even finishing the drinks, like finishing the sunset. Oh, let's, let's go back to the tent. So and she normal. seemed unaware yeah. of yeah, of yeah. what that transformation yeah. she'd been through. Also, uh, three three weeks later, I asked her. I approached the subject. I said, "Do you remember that when we was in Cornwall?" Mm. And you told me you'd watch me when I was sleeping and you seen me change. What was that about? And she just, just there was nothing there. It was just no conscious recollection of it. Right, interesting. I thought, All right, I won't push the subject. I just yeah. left it. I didn't. Uh, so, so, so that was that. So this is, this is a, a potential shape shifting or, or perception of it from her. So this is your first. Inkling that First inkling. Everything is... And then you've seen a friend, you're saying goodbye. Yeah, I've gone round my mate Alan's house, a few beers. Uh, we race mini motors together, like he's a good mate of mine. I uh, haven't seen him since the summer, actually. Yeah. But yeah, I've on the doorstep, uh, said goodbye to him. And that, well, a few weeks after this incident with Adele on holidays mm. happened, I've gone round Alan's house and... I told him what happened with Adele right. and saying she'd seen me change and watch light coming out of my lips and mm. eyelids. And he said, well, I weren't going to say anything, but he said, last month or whenever it was, when I said goodbye to you on the doorstep, he yeah. said, I, I see you as a reptilian. I said, what? And uh, they, he said the full works. So I was like about seven foot tall, like just like a... For all intensive purposes, the predator off the... Yes, yeah. It's just like a large, overpowering reptilian, was what he said. And, uh, and they, did, uh, and he did, said I weren't going to say anything, but... Yeah, right. And did he... That, did was, he that was a shocker. Did he see that as a, as a, as a momentary image, or, or...? Yeah, just like... Yeah. Well, I, I don't know how long it right, was. Right, right. Because yeah. I just said, yeah, see you later, man, and like, <laughs> left, sort of thing, but... And he's watching the predator walk away. Yeah, and he's, he's obviously <laughs> thinking, see you later. And God knows what he was thinking after that. And, and yeah, you, he's, you... He's like a, a nice chap, like mm. he's a couple of years older than me. Mm. He's not prone to telling lies mm. or making up stories. Mm. Like he's, he's an honest chap. 
So yeah. Yeah, that, that was a shocker. Yeah. It sort of links the, the incident with Adele. Yes, yeah, that absolutely. Leaves me thinking, well... And another sort of... What are these people seeing me as? Like, what's going on now? Yeah, it sort of begs the question of, you know, I wonder why if the surveillance is something to do with, with perhaps a an element of who exactly. you are yeah. in, in, in another dimensional reality. That's what and, I've started to think about. Mm, exactly, that's, that's quite a right. good point. Yeah. I've started to think, well, maybe it wasn't what I was thinking at the time that the yeah. surveillance was for. Maybe it's like yeah. something else, like yeah. a bit deeper. Yes. Because honestly, they, they spent hundreds of thousands of pounds on my surveillance, yeah. like 24 hours a day, for years. Like Even now, my phone... Every phone I get, they will find out what the number is and bug it. Right. And this is the longest I've kept the phone number for. I usually mm. just cut it up after a month mm. and mm. start again, sort of thing. But they always. And you were fine. telling you were telling me at one time about a phone that you had, and this was probably after one at the Manchester incident. Yeah. And your yeah, bags that, had that been gone was... through, and you said your phone had been tampered with because. Yeah, that it used to. It was a Sony Ericsson. Most phones, if you put them next to a radio that and your phone's active, mm. it will make like a, a noise yeah. brought near to audio equipment. Yeah. Mine used to do it from like 25, 30 feet away. Wow, yeah. My mate at the time was into sound systems and that used to say, go away with that bloody phone, will you? Okay. Get over there. Like, and yeah, yeah, within 30 feet, it used wow. to boom, boom, used to just wipe out yeah. all sorts of audio equipment. I, I sold it to a friend of one of my friends, and uh, the night I sold it to him on his doorstep, this poor bloke, I took the 25 quid and, yeah, man, it's a good phone. And the light bulb in his hallway went, and usually microwaves uh, cause high-power microwaves in close proximity to light bulbs, incandescent light Mm. bulbs. They don't mix. They usually pop light Mm. bulbs. Yeah. And yeah, it was obviously this phone was giving out such a high yeah. like, amount of radio frequency energy. It's popped this light bulb and the bloke got showered in glass and took me 25 quid and <laughs> shot off. See you later, man. Well, that, re- well, that reminds me and too just... because you've, you've also said that you've had incidents where you've been walking past just street lights and sodium street lights. Yeah. I, and you've affected them, or they've, there's been an effect as you've passed by them. I used to, I used to get quite annoyed with it, because <laughs> it was just like clockwork. I'd, I'd come home from work and get them within sometimes 70 feet of a street lamp. It would just flicker and go out. And these are the big ones. Yeah. They used to really annoy me, because I thought it was obviously the, the tracking chip inside me. Right. Obviously, they've got satellite technology which can track you if you've got a chip inside you. Mm, yeah, yeah. I used to think Indeed. it was that. And it used to really, really, really annoy me. And I used to test it out and go down roads and wait down the end of the road and look sort of half a mile and watch the street lamps for like an hour or something. They wouldn't do right. a thing. Right. So I walked up the street, they'd blink, blink, and it used to really do me head in. And did they come back on again? Yeah. 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 yeah they'd so come just, back on. just within the certain. Yeah, within a. Yeah certain range but since i've uh i was looking at a website of dr richard boylan he had some interesting things about star seeds on there right and uh he said that sometimes if you're tampered with as like a youngster or whatever and his, his exact words uh sometimes the star visitors amp up your bioelectric field right, right. and that is what wipes out these mm. And as as mm. Miles said, sometimes it, it could just be the gas in the tube that mm. gets affected by mm. an anomalous electric field coming into Your proximity. Aura. Mm. Aura so, yeah, since then I thought, well, maybe it's not the satellite mm. tracking technology. Maybe it's something positive. Yeah. It's my aura, which is possibly extending yeah. Yeah. bigger around me than what most people's probably yeah. do. I want to pick up on the second sun business again because... You kind of had that in mind, and then you heard an interview which mentioned was, this, and I'd really just like you to pick that up. I was listening to an interview recently, September, I think it was, about uh, it's an Andromedan representative, a human, Earth human uh, representative of the Andromedan Council or something, mm. been interviewed by Alfred oh. Weber, oh, the yes. futurist right. okay. author Alfred Weber. 
uh, they were having a conversation and uh, this Tolek is the bloke's uh, public persona. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He said the information he had been given that we we're going to get another sun come in and he said he was told it would be in the four to five o'clock position to our original sun. Which is and exactly what my Adele jaw had hit said. The floor when I was listening to this mm. interview, I thought, well, that's exactly the position of where Adele said it was, to the right and down, she pointed. That's really that's interesting. That's where the new sun's co- going to be. Yeah. And um, yeah, to the four to five o'clock position was what was mentioned in this video. Okay. So just, we're going to just wrap wrap up now, sort of sort of pull together some of, some of the strands. So we, we've talked about surveillance and do you, do, are you aware of, of, of the various agencies that you think might be surveilling you? Would you, uh, would you say you, you'd have an idea? Obviously, I haven't had any signed confessions, but no. MI5, <laughs> uh, MI5 are quite... Obviously, they're the, the, the British yeah. intelligence service that deals with uh, within our borders, like yeah. they deal with the situation. But I, I believe a lot of it... Some of the higher technology end of surveillance is the NSA, the National Security right. Agency. Mm. And obviously MI5 can't be seen to be doing anything too illegal on British soil. So mm. they just say, oh, you do it. And they give it to other agencies yeah. and they do it. And because mm. they're not bound by the same laws, mm. they can run roughshod and mm. do anything they want to yeah. anyone they want. Mm. So have you got any conclusions or feelings or, or perhaps they're still all coming together? And it might be years before you you get this. That uh, you know what what I'd, it's all about for you. I mentioned recently in September mm. is the, the recollection. I went to bed and again it was the same thing as when I was eleven. I was made to remember trying to put lights on okay. to illuminate the room, and all of a sudden, this is thirty years after. Right. When I was 11. Right. So just this year? Yeah, this year. Yeah. All of a sudden, bang. So. I've had this memory come back from being in my bedroom when I was 11 years old. I was in the, the corner of the room nearest where my stereo was. I was kneeling on the floor, uh, carpeted floor. It was quite a large room in the back of the school because we used to live inside the school. Right, yeah. Uh, this old building, as mm. I said. Mm. I'm in, in my bedroom, I'm on the floor, uh, all of a sudden I've got this being in front of me, uh, it's about three foot tall, I've tried to defend myself uh, with the nearest thing I could get my hands on, now at the time I thought, I've, it's almost like remote viewing, that's the only way I can right. describe it, you're not seeing it through your conscious eyes, uh, it's almost like remote viewers describe the situation in a room that they're asked to view yes. from a remote location. Mm. I've seen this being in front of me. I've grabbed this. I was told in my mind this is metal. And I've tried to hit this being with this, what is a metal tray. It's about two foot by ten inches wide. And I remember exactly thinking about it afterwards, what this tray was. It was like a, a heavy steel tray with mosaic tiles on that my dad had probably got from somewhere around the mm. world. So he used to travel widely with the military. Mm-hmm. I've picked up this tray and tried to hit this being with it. I was then telepathically told, that's not a good, very, that's not a very good idea. You shouldn't do that. So then I've gone through the thought process myself. That's not a very good idea. I shouldn't do that. And obviously I've desisted from doing that. The next thing I know, I've seen a small being run across my bedroom mm-hmm. about eight feet away. It's just run across my field of yeah, field vision. Of vision. I've, I've seen it, a small spindly, mm. just ran across the room. The next thing I know, I'm lying down, uh, horizontal, I'm probably paralysed from my left hand side I've seen like this small spindly arm with like three fingers with almost like suckers on the end I mean it could have had four fingers but all I see was three long fingers 
with this spindly extraterrestrial mm. arm and it's extended to me in friendship that's all i can describe it as oh, right. it's extended out to me to see if i would either take it or not mm. take it mm -hmm. and at the time I, th I remember thinking it's it's extraterrestrial it's female it's child which is quite interesting mm. uh of the hand was extended to me i took the hand and held it and that was the the end of that fragment uh, a couple of nights later i had another one from the same era when i was 11 years old uh, i'm in my bed in the same bedroom mm. i remember looking at the alarm clock which was a metal cheap alarm clock from the market it, with the bells on top yes, like a yeah. brass one i remember looking at it thinking i must go to the loo i've got up to go to the loo open my bedroom door and in front of me there's there's a small being about three foot tall uh long cloak like a ming the merciless collar mm. and just a small bald head that's the last thing i remember Mm. It's just opening the door and being faced with that and blank. So these memories are, are now really beginning to, 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 to surface. So from it, September, I've had three of them. Yeah. The third one is I'm trying to resist the paralysis. I've actually got out of my bed extremely traumatised. I've started to move across my bedroom with a duvet still wrapped around my head. Right, right. Like really really traumatized duvet wrapped around me i've obviously just got up out of bed all i can remember thinking is i'm fighting the paralysis i need to get up i've got up the duvet wrapped around me extremely traumatized that's the last thing i remember mm. that's the third yeah uh, recollection yeah. from my bedroom yeah so so you're 40 11. 41 now i'm 41 now that's so so exactly these, 30 years isn't that interesting right. it's quite yeah. interesting yeah and so, uh, um, again, we're, we're just sort of pulling it, pulling together. So these memories are coming in. So it, I don't know whether something's breaking down that's allowing the memories coming through yeah. or whether you're being yeah. triggered to remember. I don't know. I don't yeah. know if, if you've got yeah. an idea. But clearly, uh, to me, it, it sounds like you're about to enter a new phase of, I don't know, experience exactly. or whatever. Yeah, I've heard that when they do... Uh, mind programming on well, the intelligence services do mind programming on super soldiers and mm, that. Mm. Uh, if they don't commit suicide like with their termination programs mm. after a, about 30 odd years they start to remember right yes yeah fragments of memory so yeah, yeah. exactly what you said is yeah it's interesting a isn't distinct it distinct possibility yeah, and, yeah uh, I, I, I don't know I yeah really don't know. yeah and uh, uh, and is there anything currently going on as in you know the last day or two three or four days uh have you been given a break about three or four days after we had our first conversation yes i noticed a couple of radio frequency events with the, oh really the locking okay. on and that was eight o'clock in the morning wow and i okay. didn't have my phone on right i find if i don't have my phone on you yeah do get people crawling out the woodwork to see where you are sort of thing oh that's interesting so, yeah Yes, because you say you, you find taking the battery out of the phone yeah, that's just more effective, good practice, right? so they can't um, lock on yeah, for you. After having yeah. phones light up like Christmas trees on the bedroom floor. Yeah, absolutely. At night time, I usually disable it now yeah. before I sleep. So is there anything that you'd really like to, to finish with, to, to end our conversation with, that you'd like to get out there or share with anybody? or? Uh, all I can really say is we live in very, very interesting times and I think we're in for some very serious upheavals mm. over the next God knows how long. But Yeah, I think everybody kind of feels there's something going on. How did you f um, hear about us, by the way, Amash? Uh, I, I think I was looking at uh, some abduction stories okay. of people on mm. youtube right. i do trawl through quite a lot of mm. info on youtube i find it quite a good channel for okay. bits and pieces of info mm. 
Yeah, that's where I first come across your right. interviews, and yeah, the abduction th theme does strike a chord with me, obviously. Yeah. And I, yeah. I'm still finding out things about myself. Yeah. Uh, and also the surveillance and the harassment that you've had. I know that there's quite a bit of harassment. We just haven't been able to to fit in, but uh, I could write books on it. Uh, yeah. 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 Again, yeah. Perhaps, perhaps something you you could do, um, you know, is update us. You know, and if you were I able to keep some kind of a little, not even a journal, but a bullet point of events or something, it would. You know, we did a little catch up at some point, which we do. Perhaps come to a meeting, yeah. give us a catch yeah. up or something. Yeah. I think things will be changing thick and fast. Yeah. So do you feel better for having spoken? Uh, I do feel better for. I know you're really nervous at first, weren't you? Yeah. You're really, really yeah, a, a bit anxious. Uh, it's been 11 years or whatever, and I've not had anyone to talk to about uh, the experiences which yeah. I've been put through. Yeah. And it's, it is nice to finally get it off your chest to yeah. someone that knows. Yeah. Uh, it's got a good idea of yeah. the kind of things that I've had to deal with. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I thank you for providing the forum to... Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. ...to get these things out. Yeah. But, yeah people should know that uh, there is a lot of things going on behind the scenes and yeah. life is not all merry and jangly says. like people think it is. There's mm. quite a lot yeah. of dark manoeuvres going on behind the scenes. Mm. But there are also a lot of good manoeuvres yeah. that yeah. I would like to see come to fruition. Yeah. And do you think you've grown through your experiences? You, in a bit, it, you know, you've benefited overall yeah, from them? Yeah, they, they, they say what doesn't kill you and makes you stronger so all right well I on believe that. I'm quite strong <laughs> well on that note I just want to say thank you again for having the courage to share because I, I, I know it took quite a lot for you to do it and um, thank you. you know to to again give courage to others to to come forward and share their stories and um, to say keep us up to date yeah. and um, thanks very much really appreciate it thanks Jeff Scott thank you both thank you, thank you. thanks this is Amash and we're saying goodbye to Jeff Scott and thanks to Miles again and we're on 0795 1752 813 is our hotline and otherwise you can email us at amash at hotmail.co.uk and our website is www.amash.co.uk Thanks for watching. See you again. paused and just didn't say anything uh, I said it's alright if I get my car out then and he still didn't say anything he just stood there all as if stalling for time yeah yeah uh, all of a sudden it's helicopters about 70 to 80 foot off the ground I mean I work on buildings so yeah. I know how high a building is and yeah. I know what it looks like an yeah. 80 foot building or a 100 yeah. foot building and was this one, one helicopter? It was a black, uh, like the Bell Jet Ranger that you used to get in James Bond films. Yeah. It was one of those. It was about 70 to 80 foot off the floor. It, it comes straight over our head. It spun around about 80 metres from us. Yeah. And then come back for a, for a pass straight over us as we all stood there next to my car. Uh, yeah, we all looked up at it, thought... My God, what's going to happen next? Yeah. Uh, as soon as it had gone over for the pass, the man got in his car, like, moved it out of the way, and we were allowed to go. But yeah, this helicopter, it was jet black, uh, had loads of things bolted to the skids, right. to the underside, loads of like big, obviously, cameras and. Right, so they were coming around to take pictures. And all. Yeah, we yeah. had our pictures taken right, right, like, right, right. properly. Yeah. And uh, there we were allowed to go. Yeah. On, so you on, so you went off, and uh, I believe you might have been followed, were you then? Yeah, on the, on the way out of there, we've gone down the road about half a mile. We should have really gone straight on down this road. We were look, looking on the map at other Roman bits and pieces in the area. I said, hold on, let's, let's go down here. Like, I think my mate was reading the map, I was driving. He said, I was a Roman blah blah, so we've, we've stopped, gone down a side road that we wouldn't have normally have gone down we mm. would have gone straight on uh, we've gone into this side country lane and 
there, there was a bloke sat on a motorbike. He looked totally startled that the car was coming, and he's quickly threw his crash helmet on really quickly, as if to hide his face. Mm. And as we've gone past, I said, "Look, he's doing the dodgy. He's doing the dodgy. He's, he's either hiding ten key of skag in the bush, I think, was my, <laughs> or he's there to follow us." And we've all laughed about it. Like gone past him, uh, gone down the road, turned left, gone down another lane, stopped. All of a sudden, he's come past us. Like he's come round the bend, expecting us to still be going, but we've stopped yeah, by the road. See he's, Roman ruins. Yeah. He's had to come past us, and like, and I've seen this bloke. He was on a large motorcycle, like uh, five hundred, seven fifty, or something like that. I see him again a couple of months later. Oh, really? Uh, near to the other place I told you about, mm. Christmas Common, and he was then sat on a small one two five with an L plate on it. And I remember he was a Hi and welcome to part two of Amash and we're talking with Jeff Scott from uh, the Reading area. Jeff had just been finishing telling us in part one about uh, an incident where they were on some land, they'd met a, um, a runner who looked like a military surveillance guy and then came back to their car to find it blocked in by a man who for all intents and purposes looked like an SAS guy and who was questioning them about whether the car was stolen or not, which belonged to Jeff. So we're now going to pick up the rest of the story with Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for coming back and finishing the story with us. Yeah, uh, as I said, my car was blocked in. Uh, there was some searching questions about how we got ne how near we got to a certain compound up the hill, uh, and the bloke had an open face crash helmet this time. He was just parked by the side of the road while we was mooching about in this area. I said, that's that bloke from the right. other week. And Jay yeah, had like a Shakespearean kind of beard. Yeah. It was, it was about 50 odd. But yeah, I thought it quite strange that he was on a bike with a, a small 125 with an L plate on when mm. the other week he'd been on the big yeah. British 750 or whatever yeah. it was. Yeah, but yeah, all yeah. that's not right. right. So clearly the surveillance going yeah, on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think after that, perhaps, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, the next major sort of incident happened when you were... Um, was, was, did you go to Manchester first, or was there an incident after, before then? Uh, um, I can't remember. I can't remember anything else that stands out, but okay. I went to work in Manchester to repair the so-called IRA bomb damage, which was, was probably just an in, inside job like to regenerate yeah. the town centre. It was probably security services planted the device or in a truck or whatever it was uh yeah we went a serious allegation do you have any evidence for that or is it just rumor uh i watched a video the other day and i thought it it, it was yeah it was alleging that sort of uh scenario that that was an inside job and i thought well to be quite honest i've always thought that i've always thought it uh so so it's just something replace, I felt in my what heart. What did they replace the old buildings with? Uh, the building I worked on was... Uh, I worked on the roof of the Marks and Spencers six-storey building. It was like their flagship Marks and Spencers right. store. Hmm. Uh, I think it was six, six storeys. We were working on the roof, doing all the cladding and glazing yeah. to various hmm. bits of modules on the roof. It's a massive place. Hmm. Uh, yeah, When I used to work there... There used to be a clock tower just across from our six-storey position where I was doing most of my work. There was a clock tower and a couple of times a week like, there'd be this box in a plastic bag like, and it would move and it would be in different positions. And hmm. I always used to say to my mate, what's in the box up there? It was like someone had put a camera in to right. survey our position sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But 
yeah, I was aware of surveillance all the time. It was just normal, as I said. Yeah. It was, you know, I used to get it in three-month blocks. Oh, did you? And if you'd been really bad, they'd be outside your house for six months. And what do you mean by being bad? Uh, well, uh, that's to to come like a couple of years down the line. Right. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. So it was about 1999, I think, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was the summer of 99. Yeah. Uh, about August times. Uh, this particular week, uh, the key to my room had gone missing for. 24 hours about 24 can i can hours. i just can i just say just to just to 